And I love talking to people in terms that they understand because I, I, this is what gives a meaning to what I do. Where, where I have more of a problem is when I find scientists who don't value this and who are like, they're happy in their ivory tower. I, I, I love the continuity. And, and, I, and, and, you know, it's part of what I do also. I want what I do to be meaningful. And if I can't bring it back to something, if I can't discuss this with many people, even if it's simplifying it to the bone, but if I can't explain why I'm doing something, I'm not interested in it. My name is Balash Kegel and this is the I Scientist podcast where we explore artificial intelligence, science and the scientist behind the science. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Gael Varroco, my friend, who is a senior AI researcher at INRIA, so we call it Directeur de Recherche in France. And INRIA is uh, the Computer Science Research Institute of France. So welcome, Gael, how are you today? I'm doing great, how are you, Belash? Great, 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 and looking forward to this. So, Gael had an incredible tour in the landscape of science. So he graduated from phys in physics, experimental physics, right? Then he moved into AI, machine learning, data science, you will define what you are. Uh, and so when we met, you were working in an interdisciplinary group on medical imaging and AI. And since then it, bro it, it broadened up towards in general health and uh, social science applications. And maybe you are the best known outside the, the, the narrow ML community as the founder of Scikit-Learn, which is the main data science li library used by, let's say, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of data scientists, I guess, all over the world. So it's, it's an amazing variety of directions and, and interests. So my first question would be, how, how, how would you call yourself? How, how do you describe yourself to somebody who just, you know, learned about AI in the last couple of years where after the lab leak? So are you a data scientist, a researcher, social? I, I, I usually don't like putting labels on, on, on people, right? I, I think, you know, above all, I'm a scientist, but I also like uh, technology and creating technology. But I think it always comes back to being a scientist. Mm. And I don't like labels. You know, I see. People used to ask me, but are you, are you still a physicist? What does that mean? <laughs> Once a physicist, always a physicist, right? Maybe. Uh, OK, so what I would mostly interested in, be interested in is like, how do you choose what you work on? What governs your choices? Mm. Because it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's really an amazing, uh, you know, variety it came from physics, AI, social science, health. So how did you choose? What, how, what, were, what were the steps defined by when we went through this? I guess it starts uh, uh, with bad reasons. I think uh, one of the reasons why I, I studied physics is that my father was a physicist mm. and I grew up in this environment. Uh, and so, of course, you know, I was more good at it in, in class than other things because I had more stimulation. And I had an amazing course in quantum physics by Edouard Brezin that was uh, very stimulating. And, you know, where I was also doing my study, we were surrounded by very good quantum physicists. So, you know, one thing leading to another, I end up, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing a PhD in, in quantum physics. And I was always, I always liked computers. Computers were, were, they were pleasant, you know, from really early on, I would, I would code on my calculator uh, during class instead of listening to, to lessons. Uh, and, and during my PhD, I guess, uh, coding was one of the parts that I preferred. 
And after my PhD, it was like, uh, do I do I want to go on in, in, in physics? Uh, I might want to be doing something else. And I, I moved to to INRIA and to um, data science for for neuroscience via open source software because I was already doing open source software. And via the network, I meet uh, uh, someone who tells me, well, you know, there are good things to be done. I visit them. And just the idea of using, you know, data mining, I had no idea what it meant. But using data mining on brain images to understand the brain, that sounded super exciting. Of course, you know, <laughs> it was a very naive view. And then and then in AI, I learned a lot. I learned about uh about statistics, about computing in a more like formal way. Uh, I, I, I learned about machine learning. I also interact a lot with uh, with a neuroscientist. And there I learn a lot, well, a lot about the brain, but also a lot about psychology, a lot about how basically science is done in a broader setting than, than math and physics. And that was really interesting. And after a while, there's this thing that comes in and is like, are you using your energy to solve the best problems? And I was thinking, well, maybe not. We have pretty important problems uh, uh, in the world. And some of the really difficult scientific questions are related to human behavior. That's also something I was learning via, via neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and psychology is human behavior is something very hard to understand from a scientific perspective, but it's not like we don't know anything. And then there's this other thing is that, so, you know, I, I, I was doing machine learning and many people were using it and there was scikit-learn and the number one big players we were interacting with were things like banks, insurances, uh, consulting companies, and there was a trend in what they were doing. And it was not what I was doing. I was like, okay, this seems like there is there are more important things. It's hard to define what's more important, but there are things where I can I can have an impact by working on them. And so I wanted to work on things that are related to social science at large where you know you're looking at behaviors of people in society and using machine learning but definitely not to do ad placements or things like this and health was definitely a place where i thought you know this is really interesting and so we're working on health but we're also working on, on things like education uh, i had i have a going to be supervising a PhD uh, uh, next year in uh, applications to economy. And I, this is the space where I want to be now. I think it's a good trade-off between what I understand and bringing something useful to the world. And that's these days how I choose what I work on. It sounds uh, amazing, actually. You know, when, when we worked together in the Center for Data Science, that was my biggest question. Like where do we uh, where do we have the biggest impact and how do we measure it? It's hard, so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it it is hard and it's not something that my scientific training prepared me for to make this decision. No, 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 no. Well, the thing is, um, I don't know about the training you had, but uh, a lot of the training I had, not all of it was very set in a, in a scientific framework. You know, as I, I've moved across different sciences, uh, uh, you realize that, you know, there is not one scientific framework. And, you know, you hear about the scientific method, you hear about things, and, and actually there's not one scientific method. There are different more scientific methods. And it, in a sense, they're adapted to solve different problems. And, but now what makes it really complicated is that as a scientist, you inherit implicitly from a certain way of asking uh, questions and bringing answers. And that, in a sense, that, that you know, almost paints your, your, you're in the corner. And the question is, if you're, if you're interested in, you know, beyond the ivory tower of academia and beyond the ivory tower of your own academic field, how do you advance knowledge, any kind of knowledge? You know, it could be, you know, basic 
scientific knowledge, it could be operational knowledge in a given in a given setting. And you know, confronting myself to people who had done very different studies than than me, and you know, arguing for hours over coffee or beer really taught me this. And then I I got really interested. And I I read books about epistemology. I I read a lot about history of science and everything. But yeah. <laughs> so what what did you argue about? Oh, is this useful? That's something that always keeps uh. up. You know, is this is is such a you know, how do you value results? You know, oh, I've done this thing, it's it's really exciting. Well, I'm not excited about a lot. I told about this, you know, whatever. You've been basically you've been basically munging numbers, you know. What does that teach me about the brain? Uh, uh, who cares about your 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 munging numbers? Oh, but I'm excited because of this. Or that or the other way around is like, you know, I, there's this theory about the brain, and we go like, that's not a theory about anything. It's just, just a bunch of words. And so you, know, <laughs> you you learn to you know confront your views on science. And and I remember a discussion with my father, a physicist, uh, early on. I would say, you know, and 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 so we have this model, and immediately my father would say, that's not a model. <laughs> And then you realize model means so many different things across science. You know, in 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 medicine, a model is is uh, for instance a man an animal on which you can reproduce some aspects of a medical condition. So you have uh, uh, mice models of autism. Uh, that's oh. like <laughs> so. Model is you know a very loaded term or. And it's really interesting, you know, what a theory is, what a model is, what's an evidence, uh, what's a proof, uh, uh, what's an acceptable piece of evidence, what's uh, what constitutes progress and what doesn't constitute progress. Uh, and then, the, you know, the more you move around, and that's one thing I've always liked doing is always try not to stay in my comfort zone and try to, you know, convince people outside of my comfort zone. And that requires by construction playing their game. So you're trying to publish in places that are completely outside your, your education. You need to learn the game. And then you realize, you know, it's, it's there isn't as much to science and that is absolute as I, I thought it was. <laughs> Amazing. So what do you think made you different or a better AI researcher by by interacting with all these other sciences or scientists? Uh uh, I learned to think out of the box. I think that's really important. I also learned, uh, so first I think, you know, my training as a, as a physicist is really good training because a lot of AI research these days is empirical. And, uh, you know, if you, you do pure math, uh, you're not taught uh, empirical work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good empirical work and there's less good empirical work. And you just, knowing how to do good empirical work is important. Uh, and and then I, I really like questioning the framing. You know, we frame something in a certain way, and I really like questioning the framing. And I also think, you know, that's one place where AI research can easily uh, uh, be too conservative. And many people are saying this is that you know, there's just too much, which is oh, and we've improved the performance on a given benchmark. Not saying it's not useful, it's very useful, but defining the benchmark, defining the performance measure and all this, that's really important. And, and AI research has actually been somewhat of a back and forth between defining a, a benchmark and a, and a canonical problem and improving it. And this, this back and forth is really interesting. I see it. I mean, I see a connection here to the previous question because benchmarks represent the importance of problems you make a benchmark and you make it popular by saying that if you solve this that's going to be a big big breakthrough right so in in, in sort of so you can separate the solution which is like like iterating the scientific method solving the problem from the importance of the problem which comes from somewhere else. It comes from another kind of argument, right? So the uh, in, in in AI actually, we sort of formalize this process by defining benchmarks based on importance. Well, we claim they're based on importance, but uh, uh, they're based on data ability, availability. They're based on some form of word popularity. Uh, they're based on good framing of the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I see. So they still that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the way science works, right? You know, I can't do a benchmark on health for multiple reasons, but but it's not, you know, it's not currently I can't do this. I can do other benchmarks. And so we move from problem to problem. And so as you know, AI is very much an engineering discipline, it really likes having you know, a problem where, that it can solve. Other disciplines like asking problems. And I think it's, I think you're better scientist if you like both. So you, you already mentioned it, but uh, I binged watched your recent talks, which was amazing. I mean, one of them, you say that uh, AI went from a mathematical to an empirical science. So for those who, you know, just got acquainted with AI in the last years when GPT got out of the lab, what do you mean by that? And how long and what's happened in AI that that made this change possible or necessary or why did it happen? Well, so if we got, go back like 15 years or a bit more when I got involved, a lot of um, AI research or machine learning research was about finding approximations of uh, mathematical problems by easier to solve mathematical problems, so typically convex relaxations, and then you know studying how we could we could optimize these things, we could we could minimize something. So it was a lot about this. And so we were we were convex back in these days. And uh, and I think you know one thing that that really changed the, the field was that um, because people framed some problems in a really interesting way, and here I really you know really think of um, um, Li Feifei, who I think is an amazing researcher. And I think her ImageNet paper is not read enough. So what 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 she did in in framing the problem in the ImageNet paper was extremely powerful. Uh, and and so this was more in computer vision, which is not what what I was doing. But but from what I understand, there was a bit of a rupture where people were uh, tackling things in a very reductionist way. So basically, tackling aspects of pose, uh, uh, all kind of different aspects of computer vision. And what she said is, she said, you know, how about this? How about we we take a very large data set that is extremely rich, we annotate it in an extremely rich way, and and they annotated. The, the data set in a, in a very clever way because they used WordNet, which was an ontology, and they mapped it to the image. And that's a very non-trivial choice. And, and, and then she said, you know, okay, and then we get, you know, performance metrics that are relevant. And, you know, I don't remember what method they used to do the learning in this paper, but that's not relevant. They had framed the problem in such a useful way. And that enabled then us to realize that there were other ways of tackling the formal problem. And these other ways that were non-convex uh, were, were really powerful. And some people had been advocating uh, uh, for this forever, of course. But you know, we're back into you know, what's important and what's valued. And framing the problem in a certain way suddenly uncovered the, the power of these things. I completely agree. I think she she should have got got the Turing Prize because ImageNet pushed the computer vision forward by 10 years. And it's a pity and this is actually part of the game that uh, the people who design the benchmarks are not appreciated as much as those who design the solutions for the benchmarks. Yeah, that's that's, that's a problem computer science has. Yeah. so talking about benchmarks, we actually worked together five years ago on a challenge on autism. And that was also that was fascinating for me from a lot of different points of view. For example, how hard it is to really gather data for it this is. kind of uh, applications, but also the, the outcome of the challenge was really, really amazing. This is going to be a little bit technical, but for those who are in AI, I think they will appreciate this. So, Tell me, tell me about this autism challenge. How did it, how was it born and, and what were the findings? Well, I can tell you how it was born because it has a, a, a long history. It was born from, it was born many years ago, actually, because um, 
I was working with a, with a PhD student on a, on a specific problem, which is defining brain regions from the data. And we were like, how do we know those brain regions are, are useful? And, and that PhD student, Alexandre Abraham, was really brave because he was like, okay, one thing we, 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 we can do that's useful is that if we're able to, to classify a medical condition based on those brain regions. And so he assembled a pipeline and he, he took the set and he benchmarked the pipeline. And, he, and we reached out to the people who knew the data set. It was an open data set, but we reached out to the people who knew the data set really well. And then we worked together. And okay, so we could predict, but they were like, no, what's really important is to know whether you can predict across sites because there's heterogeneity in the medical condition. And, and so, sites so we worked... by sites, you mean like hospitals and yeah, acquisition mm -hmm. sites, so hospitals. And so we ended up predicting across countries, across continents, which is really interesting for autism because autism is a, is a symptom defined uh, disease. And, and so, uh, you know, the question is, you know, how much of, of this labeling is cultural? Mm. And, and so because of that framing, by the way, because of the framing that we could predict across sites and predicting across sites uh, is actually non-trivial, uh, we, we got interest in, uh, in the application domain, in, in you know, uh, uh, neuroscience and, and psychology, and that paper you know, was, was well cited. And, and so then the question is, a few years later, is you know, can we do better? And that's where the challenge comes in. You know, I, by, by then I had started being worried in um, the fact that we fool, fool ourselves because we play with data until we find something. It's just too easy to do this. And, and so I had started, you know, worrying that, well, you know, I can fool myself too. So, so I got excited about the challenge because it's about, you know, not, not doing it myself. And so having a sampling of other people and importantly, not biasing myself. So that's why it was really interesting. And so, you know, we run the challenge and the way we run the challenge is that we gather as much uh, data as possible. Uh, and actually, you know, what, what, what uh, started the challenge was that a friend reached out and said, you know, uh, well, we, we can gather a lot of data, so should we run the challenge? So we run the challenge. Uh, it takes a lot of time to set up the data. We, we, we have the people uh, compete on it. And then, uh, and then we analyzed uh, the results uh, post hoc. And what came out is that uh, very simple methods uh, were the best performers. And complex methods that people have been publishing about are, are amazing actually were not, not very useful. Uh, I can't claim I'm that surprised, but it's, it's interesting to see, to see this uh, happen. What was really interesting to me is that people were incentivized not to fool themselves. And yet, a lot of them did. And I remember, you know, after the fact, when we, we gave out the prices and we, uh, uh, we discussed, you know, the, the, the results, I remember some of the people were incredibly surprised to see that they had fooled themselves. And this was striking to me because I was like, you know, people fool themselves. They have no idea they're doing this. And they, they're doing this with the you know, the best will in the world and the best incentives in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, actually, it, 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 it relates a little bit to, you know, my, my previous guest was uh, Vava Gligorov, who, who you know too. And he said that in their big physics collaborations, it's like 1,500 people, the analysis goes through a collaborative review inside the experiment and the way they check this that they don't bias themselves is collaboratively. Like everybody has their own pet questions mm -hmm. to ask. You pretty much know actually who, who will ask what, but somehow because so many questions are coming at your analysis and everybody's looking at different aspects, at the end you have less chance to, to fool yourself. In, in data science, we ended up doing these data challenges where you have like a hard measure of not fooling yourself because at the end, usually the, if it's done correctly, the, the way the methods are evaluated are on completely fresh data that was not seen by the participants. And so in Kaggle, it happens a lot that, that uh, 
the people who are winning on this, what we call the public leaderboard, the data that is given to them to train their methods are falling down in the private leaderboards. It's, it's very, very interesting. But I was also surprised that even though it wasn't the latest deep learning algorithm that won the challenge, the, the, the results were pretty good. So you could predict autism from brain imaging at about 80% accuracy. You see, yes, the accuracy. So, so that was, how, how was it um, uh, accepted by the, the, the medical community? Or how was it seen as? So it's been published for a year. It's uh, cited a bit, but not that much. And I think what we're getting from the, from the committee is indeed yes, but is that of any interest and uh, the more i understand medical applications the more i understand the question uh, so of course you know actually the question is not the the way we rephrase it is not is that of any interest sure it's of some interest but out of the so many things that we could be doing should we be doing this given that a brain image is so expensive Given that, you know, that result is by construction uh, uh, an optimistic result in the sense that we probably didn't have any of the weak autism people in there, the light autism. Uh, and so, you know, there was no ambiguous case. Uh, given that we're looking at uh, young adults, and if you want to do something about autism, you probably want to diagnose babies. Uh, uh, so, so yes, yes, it's, I'm, I'm still convinced it's useful. The question is, uh, uh, are we going to be able, so and then the question is, should we prioritize this? And, you know, that's one reason why I'm no longer working on brain imaging is that out of this, so many huge challenges, uh, I'm, I'm these days, I guess I'm a, I'm a short term person and I'm interested in trying to bring value today and not tomorrow. And it's bloody hard. <laughs> so how do you measure the your impact, your value? Uh, it's hard, but you need to work with the people who understand the problem. And you know, I'll 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 be convinced I've had you know really good impact if I have something that's deployed somewhere. And, and and then we do what's known as an impact evaluation, which I think is very important and very hard. And you basically look at, and you look at many things, but you basically look at, uh, try to, to see whether causally your intervention on the system. So you deploying this thing actually brought some benefits to some measures of hopefully health. And everything here is hard, right? The causal thing, I mean, a randomized control trial of deploying an AI system wouldn't be a bad idea, by the way. But uh, the intervention is likely to be at, uh, at the organization level. Because when you deploy an AI system, you need to think about it as the, at least in health, you need to think about it as the organization level. And is that going to free time from, from medical doctors? Uh, is that, uh, uh, on the other hand, are you going to like, Overdiagnose and and bring in many people to the the neurologist. Uh, uh, are you going to um, enable useful prevention, or are you going to uh, predict things on which you can't intervene? Uh, and and so then you know what we would need to do is uh, some form of randomized controlled trial at the uh, at the organization, which is doable via techniques uh, related to what's known as cluster trials. So basically, you're gonna you know randomize which uh, which health uh, uh, organization gets uh, uh, gets the system and doesn't. But you know the scale and the expense of these things is crazy. People do that in economics, uh, development economics, for instance. They, they they do that, and I think we should consider these things. It's so interesting that you went into this attraction because my, it was very interesting. But my question was more, most like more about how do you decide where your value will be impactful? Because your 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 first thing you said that you you have to talk to the people who are who know the problem. But when we talk to the people who knew the problem in CDS, the Center for Data Science, they were all super excited about their own problems. So it was not helpful. Their excitement was not helpful in for us to decide whether we should uh, 
you know, recognize Mars craters or solar storm or do the autism challenge? Well, the, the first thing is, yeah, you talk to people, but you take everything they say with a grain of salt. Second, your Joe average uh, uh, academic uh, has a fairly narrow focus. So with public health, you have people who are known as, in France, are known as public health doctors. They're basically public health researchers. And they keep asking that question. You know, they keep asking, you know, what are the useful interventions? So if you go, actually, if you, if you go closer to academic fields that are at the policy level, whether it's public health or develop, developmental uh, uh, economics or things like this, you get a bit more of that. Uh, you know, if you're a physicist, you know, you, you, you build your tool. But if you're trying to be a, a physicist who worries about, about um, uh, policy making, then you need to question your tool. And in this sense, you know, um, the International uh, Panel for Climate Change uh, is doing this really well. And then you need to interact with other people who think at the system level in terms of society. Uh, that's something I've become convinced about. But isn't it interesting that there are a lot of people who are doing physics where, yeah, climate change is a big thing, but if you think about particle physics, its impact is unforeseeable and very long term, right? Yeah, so then there's a big question here, which is one I'm very interested in is, you know, the link between scientific and potentially technological progress and in societal progress. And if you if you think in the very long term, you you can have claims like basically technological progress and scientific progress is good. I think it pretty much holds. But if you try to look at the history of, of technology and science, you realize that it's a very very non-direct trajectory. It goes through loops, and that uh, and my current thinking because I've also on Twitter there's a lot of uh, uh, fighting. You know, AI good, AI bad, bang. And my current thinking is that often for technology, especially you know disruptive technology, to to lead to to societal progress, you need society to adapt, and you need social efforts. And if you don't invest on those social efforts, uh, then it doesn't happen. And, and often, actually, if you look at the short term, short term technology is not beneficial. Uh, and I mean, and talking technology, not even talking science, you know, basic science like particle physics, it's not beneficial to the, to the many. It's beneficial to a few people. And then you need a lot of work to make it beneficial to the many. And now science is even more complex because you know between science and and technology uh, uh, there's a lot that happens yeah yeah actually my my current thinking about technology is that it's it there's always a goal usually it's a goal to improve something and usually it goes sideways that it improves something, but there are also things that are harder. And a lot of times, especially the AI, if you think about the recommendation engine AI, which was built for giving you better content and ended up make you addict to content. Who was it built to give you better content? It wasn't built. Was it built to give you better content? Well, I, I, I remember the net. If you, if you talk about data challenges like the Netflix challenge in 2007, that was basically to give you movies that you will like. Yes, but it's not better content. It's to keep you consuming no. on the platform. You know, one of the, the huge benefits of their, their recommender uh, engine to Netflix is that it hides the, how empty their catalog is. You know, if you come to Netflix wanting to see a film, so often you don't find it. But if you go from, you know, hop to hop on the recommender engine, then of course by construction, everything is on Netflix. I think that's, that's the, yeah. the, the number one value proposal of the, the recommender engine for Netflix. For social networks, it's same thing. It's maximizing a, a entailment, you know, basically keeping you on that thing. It can be anything, but it tended to do that, especially with TikTok, which was actually built on this technology to actually keep you there. 
I the think... technology is built with a goal. You said you said you said it yourself. And so when people build their recommender and ensure maybe it could be tuned to different ways. But you know, the, the, when they start instantiating it, they start instanting it, instantiating it with the logic of the of the of the organization. And and then you know it's minor things, but basically then you know those things creep in, and as a consequence, we have what we have. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So, so going back, what I was, why I wanted to say that these things go some, even if there is good intention and they want to, let's say, increase your connectivity or social whatever standing or something that that you could deem, uh, judge good. It might go sideways. For example, it might get you addicted, but the things that gets you addicted that you can get rid of actually makes you stronger. See what I mean? I'm not saying that you should get addicted and then get rid of it, but it, when it happens, the only way it happens is that you transform yourself out of it. It happened with me, that's why I'm talking about this. You know, I, I got hooked on when a short video was on Facebook started to come in my face, I got hooked on cage fights, you know? It was pretty bad, short, but pretty bad. My addictions are usually like that. Because my, you know, my frontal lobe wakes up the day after and says, no, it's not possible to do this. So, but I have to do something about it to control my other self that it, you know, before going to sleep doesn't have any control. And so I did two things. One was getting rid of Facebook on my phone. I still log in on, on computer, but it's easier to control. The other is I, I went down in the dojo because I figured out that the reason why I was addicted to that particular content is that something attracted me. So it was this mysterious, you know, way of finding out. It's almost like a psychotherapeutic uh, But how process. many people, you know, don't do that? If you look at the history of, um, of um, you know, smoking, of cigarettes, of tobacco, it's not good. It's not good at all. You realize that uh, uh, you know the system and and the key key decision makers in the system uh, was not built in the interest of the people, and the individuals in the system were all you know parts of a wider logic, and they were all you know doing their job. Yeah, no, as I'm saying I this, agree, it agree, reminds me something, you know, a place yeah. where individuals were all doing their job and just executing orders that were coming, you know, from above, that was part of a, a bigger logic. I mean, I'm talking about uh, about the Nazis, uh, and I hadn't, you know, ever made this connection, just doing it live. But, you know, the fact that, you know, you're, you're, you're part of a wider system, and you don't really question the wider system you're part of, because... You don't really understand it. Any, anyhow, it's not your job, you know, you're whatever, a programmer, a scientist. Um, it's dangerous. <laughs> no, I, no I, I, I'm not defending uh, technology. I'm just saying that, that this is the way I see the world actually improving through these things. Yeah, yeah, we adapt. The world improves because we adapt. So, for example, I, I, I will have another... Um, guest tomorrow who has a book on Dante's uh, Divine Comedy where he actually goes through all the bad scenes you know in the bottom of hell and then the lighter scenes on the top of hell and then purgatory where people are like struggling with, with transforming themselves into somebody good and the, 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 the interesting thing was for me that how little um, addiction was mentioned like the only thing you you could have ad be addicted to in 1300 was food so it was called gluttony and it was a tiny little group somewhere in purgatory who were struggling with food addiction right and through technology actually this addiction became sort of like the the main minor sin <laughs> that somehow keeps people closed. You see what I mean? So yeah. yeah. There's this, I, I don't remember the name, but there's this notion in economics that um, 
uh, um, well brings uh, added uh, a quality of life to a certain point. And then there's a paradox where added wealth actually doesn't add quality of life. Uh, uh, and, and so then the problem is that the reason why, why we have this is power. Because, because money defines power. Because with money, I can do I can do anything. I can I can board on the plane faster than, than you. I can get expensive uh, hospital that will cure me. Uh, bad. Uh, I can I can get all kind of terrible things with money, and and so for because 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 at some point you know more money doesn't doesn't bring better quality of life. You need to create other needs, and addiction is a good way of creating another need. That's my view of it. <laughs> Like you mean the system creates a need? Yeah, the system keeps creating needs, always, everywhere. Ah, okay. So instead of going towards money, you go towards something that keeps you addicted. Well, no, that's the way. That's the way you you get people to go towards money. Uh, to, you, 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 okay, sorry, you want people to give you money because because you you want ah, power, okay. and so because you want to get people to give you money, you need to create something for them, and an addiction is a really good way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. What what was surprising to me that this is actually a modern minor because, sin because because so somehow technology made it possible to to create not like, only technology, mm -hmm. also because we have enough wealth that we're in the extra. Ah, I see. Yeah. Uh, it's not only technology. I think it's also the fact that 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 many of our countries uh, uh, have enough wealth that we're basically doing extra things. Ah, so okay, so we are higher up in the Manslow's pyramid, right? We don't, but th that's it actually. That's what I was thinking about. Like in thirteen hundred, you really had to struggle to f feed your kids, so you didn't have time yeah. to get addicted. Yeah, feeding so, your yeah, kids, okay. staying healthy, uh, that was already a lot of work, and uh, you were basically you didn't have extra. Okay, so this is a great direction. I actually wanted to ask you about your relationship to money, uh, but on the subject of open source and scikit-learn and incentives and uh, that kind of cloud. Uh, because I want to talk about a little bit about scikit-learn, I think, uh, because I don't think all the... So, so, so basically, let me say just this, like everybody knows GPT now because it's out of the lab. For me, GPT is, is like your Formula One engine, you know, with the V12 engine, and it really needs a lot of care and very good uh, fuel to, to train on. But then you have Scikit-Learn, which is basically your power steering and your diesel dozer, the things that you, you, all yeah. the cars need. But bicycle. Nobody knows. bicycle. Bicycle. I would ah. rather picture it as a bicycle, even nice. though... The People don't like bicycles as much as I like. I mean, or a small car. You know, it's like a small car. Yeah, like your commute, your commuter <laughs> car. That's what it is. Okay. And it's also very wide. It's for me. It's like maybe a mechanician's toolbox that you don't really have to know. You just bring your car to the mechanician and they fix it. So tell me more about Scikit Learn. Like, what is it? How was it born? How did you get into it? And why? Okay, so we're we're in two thousand and nine. I'm starting to understand machine learning, but I'm just starting, by the way. Uh, I come from a background. Well, uh, I come from a history of uh, uh, contribution in open source, especially in the the Python ecosystem, which I had been uh, working with during my PhD and um, and at a startup in the US. Uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm understanding this and uh, uh, I started thinking, you know, basically some of those algorithms are, are basic algorithms that everybody needs to have there. You know, they need to be available for everyone. And, and so the question is, how do we do this? And I'm not very happy with everything that exists. And so, uh, so together with uh, the person who was my, my advisor back then, Bertrand Thirion, we uh, we just decided, okay, we're 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 going to invest in this, and uh, we're going to ask Inria uh, to uh, help us investing in this, 
and uh, and so one thing that I, so one thing that was important for me is to build something that was for the Python ecosystem, and so I didn't want to build yet another tool because there were too many. So I I I, I knew that there was an abandoned code somewhere uh, that was community owned, and so I basically contacted the person behind the abandoned code and was like, okay, can we can we take it and uh, and uh, you know basically rip it apart. And so, so he was afraid and he was like, sure, I'm not working on this. He was actually, the, the nice story is that he had started working on this and then he went uh, working on lower level things, not by side by things that were more basic for the ecosystem. And so they, the, these things had improved so much that we could now build a, a tool about. And then to me, the goal was to make those algorithms that are basically applied math algorithms available to a broader scientific community. Uh, for neuroscience, but also for physics, I you know I came from physics. I think back then one of my plans was to go back to physics and work on things like turbulence with um, uh, with machine learning. I thought you know this is a really interesting uh, scientific topic. I still think it is, but uh, uh, so it's like you know I, I need those tools for that. And uh, and and what what uh, I had not foreseen is that it was of interest outside of uh, basic science outside of academia and that what we were doing to make it easy to use and understandable by people who had basic understanding of, uh, of applied math was great for data scientists because I mean we, we aren't that different from data scientists and and I think you know that's that's the, the reason why it was so successful is that we created a tool that was very well targeted for uh, you know a, a certain niche of people that niche that you know grew quite big uh, uh, and and it was in a sense quite different from other tools that were targeted to other kind of people you know people you know either they would you know consider that users you know couldn't learn to code or or that uh, uh, users had to be experts we were in the middle and yeah then it grew a lot yeah, I mean, it grew a lot and now it's not the scientific community, but the business community that, that is using it a lot, right? Yeah. And so, but it's still, uh, uh, so, so basically it's an open source project, which means all of the code is on the internet and anybody can contribute to it. I'm very much interested in you describing the, 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 the governance structure because, you know, an open source code that, that is basically the, the code of a, the research group of 10 people that's one thing you can put it on online people can look at it they can use it and eventually they can contribute but scikit-learn became something very different right it's yeah. and it's it's there is no company behind because the way the, what you describe is basically a, like a successful startup that went for a niche and then the thing that the niche was interested in got viral because there was a much bigger market, but Scikit-Learn is not a company and you are a CEO who is not a CEO because there is no, no company, right? So how does this work? How do you give incentives well, to people, etc.? I'm not a CEO. We decided quite a few years ago that we would not go for the model that's uh, in open source is often known as benevolent dictator for life. <laughs> Uh, uh, we would go for the model that's known as steering committee. So we have a steering committee of, I'm not sure, like a bit less than 10 people. Uh, uh, the steering committee is actually not, uh, doesn't make many decisions. That's kind of the goal. The steering committee is there to resolve ties, resolve things where, where it's hard to make a decision, but it's not there to make many decisions. And then we have a broader group which is the group of what we call core developers. Uh, and those make many decisions. Uh, and these days we're actually evolving this to have an even broader concept to the concept of core groups because uh, we're more and more realizing that uh, uh, we need to have different stakeholders that make some, uh, some of the decisions. And so uh, the way basically you get um, you get voting power. You 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 know uh, go come in these groups. Is that uh, you work on certain aspects of the of the projects? It could be code, but it could also be communication, for instance. 
and, uh, and and you basically get recognized by your peers. And so we have an, an internal proposal, which is to uh, add someone to one of the core groups. And then there is a vote uh, and this person gets in. And if we're looking at, at, um, uh, at uh, development, uh the way the way you know the code evolves is that um uh people can propose things but they're not always accepted actually they're not that often accepted uh and there there are guidelines which are you know very strict but on top of this there's a more difficult concept which is we can't embark everything if you know you put too much things in a boat it, it sinks uh, and so you know it's a question of priority and so we try to 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 expose, uh, uh, you know, not I don't like roadmaps. We might have a roadmap somewhere on the on the website, but it's more a vision, you know, where do we want to go? Uh, uh, and, and 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 then you know we basically try to act uh, accordingly to our vision. And then the difficulty is is you know not everybody agrees, and the core group people tend to agree because we're very based on consensus. We're very based on you know discussion and trying to to understand each other's point of view and if we disagree we're trying to basically explain the point of view until we find a, a place where we agree and usually that that makes us stronger uh the problem is that sometimes people are not part of those discussions and and a lot of this happens in the open but not everything and and may not you know completely share our understanding uh and it's difficult because everything is a gray zone <laughs> So how is it connected to value? Like how, how is this a business community who is actually the basic user of Scikit-Learn can influence where it goes? So for this, because there's no money a, involved, right? They, they, they there is money pain. involved. There ah. is money involved. Uh, they started being money involved a few years ago. Uh, we just basically can't. Uh, uh, it's, it's too big and we basically can't, um, uh, can't get it to run in, only by working uh, on it uh, during nights and weekends. That's not how it works. Uh, so, you know, as, as you know, because you, you helped with that, many years ago, we were mostly funded by grant money, uh, academic grant money. And these years, we have the situation where some uh, important companies may employ uh, core developers, or actually they may employ people who are not core developers, but who are contributing with the mission of con to contribute. Not that many companies do this, but, but some companies do this. Uh, it's really interesting. In a sense, you know, I, I, I've always admired the, the Linux project and it's uh, the, the, the way it was, it was organized. And I, I realize we're actually getting a bit closer to this, right? We have major companies uh, for instance, hardware providers who employ someone with the mission not to make the software work better on the specific hardware, but rather to make the software more healthy, because if it's more healthy, then it can, on top of this, work well on the hardware. So we've gotten to this point, which is an amazing point. And I should give credit to NVIDIA because they're, they're literally paying someone. And when that person came, I was like, okay, so what's your mission? You know, are you going to try to get basically CUDA code in Scikit-Learn? And the person was like, no, my mission is to make Scikit-Learn super healthy so that we can interact with NVIDIA. And they've been true to their world. So it's, eco it's like ecosystem building for it's them. an ecosystem building and there of course there are other companies we have we have an insurance company that employs someone we have data science uh, 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 companies that sell tools on data science that employ people we have a foundation where companies that don't feel that they're you know big enough or that they have the the uh, uh, the knowledge inside the company to 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 grow and employ a core dev that they can uh, give money to the foundation uh, and and employ people and then they get uh, I wouldn't really call it voting power they get consensus building power uh, uh, on the money they 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 give so it's really interesting that we are going to have you know steering committee meetings where uh, people talk. And you know, basically, every every person on on the board 
uh, explains uh, their their challenges and their priorities for cycle. Right? And then we try to do consensus building, and we're like, okay, you know, different companies from different uh, uh, business uh, points of view, what can we find that's important for enough people that we should invest on it? That's really interesting. So that's the current situation. Uh, and and I think to grow more, we would need the red hat of Scikit-Learn if you want to do the Linux uh, uh, analogy. So what's because, that model? Well, we need integration. Yeah. What's missing is integration. So machine learning is only a little bit of the data science pipeline in the real life. So we need integration. We need integration to databases. We need integration to model serving. Uh, and, and we need we need someone who can be uh, uh, who can provide uh, uh, supports and services on people who build integrations. Say you 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 have an insurance company and you have you know decision making logic. You don't want this thing to go down. You want somebody to help your architecture the system, and you want somebody that you can call on the phone uh, if you have like a super important emergency or a potential security breach. Which is what Red Hat does. I see. I see. I see. How is it related to the deep learning ecosystem? Uh, I, I think it's complementary. So, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Formula One. I, I, I think of monster trucks. Uh, but uh, 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 that said, you know, uh, so I, th there's this notion of appropriate technology, which is that you should build a technology to solve a problem, and you should think about the problem you're trying to solve, and that you know relates to the discussion we were having before. Uh, and I think it's a very important notion, uh, and and this is basically how I see psychic learning. You know, I work in health, and we work in in hospitals. We need to work in hospitals. We and and then you know we're kind of constrained with the uh, with the uh, the resources we have, the data we have. And I, I try in my research to be fairly agnostic to technology. I try to use the best technology, and I use deep learning sometimes. Uh, but you know, second learning comes back often, very often. So you know, you know, try to avoid using too big of a track is an important thing for all kind of reasons. You know, uh, if we, you know, if we think, for instance, of GPUs, I think you know they're only. My my guesstimate is that there are only like a, a thousand A one hundred in France, and you know only very few actors have these. So if you become tied to hardware that is hard to get, you're losing your autonomy. And autonomy, by the way, is an important aspect of ethics in general, especially ethics of automation. Uh, so you don't want to disempower people. And so scikit learn is about, you know, how can we make it as simple as possible, including, you know, not relying on too much data, not relying on too much hardware. Now, for some things, deep learning is the right answer. In, in, in this, you know, in this thought process of autonomy, pre-trained deep learning is actually super useful. Uh, not everybody needs to be training the deep nets. You know, you can take pre-trained deep nets and they can be very useful. In no way are we going to do computer vision without pre-trained deep nets. Uh, and so here we have a very interesting complementary complementary aspect. So I mean, you know, even if you're in a resource limited environment, which most of our most environments are, uh, you, you might want to combine, you know, a pre-trained uh, deep net. With scikit learn. And in my experience, by the way, most applications by a wide margin work with at least some, some aspect of tabular data. And if you're doing this, you probably want to combine pre trained models for text and images with the tree based models uh, for, uh, uh, for the rest. So, you know, I really think. Uh, I'm, I'll be very happy to use deep learning when it uh, when it solves all my needs. These days, I do need a mixture of different things. And 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 going back to where we sit in the ecosystem, I, I really like PyTorch not, not only as a, as a technological object; it's a beautiful library, but also with the way they've been building a, an ecosystem and relying on a foundation. And you know, I really see them as 
part of a broader ecosystem with sometimes a similar philosophy. I see. Okay, I'll get back to this point, but I still want to dig a little bit into the sociology of the scikit learn organization. Like, how many people are there in the different uh, layers of this onion? So, in the core groups, I say I don't know the numbers, but I say we have we we have thirty ish people in the core groups. We have communication and marketing. That's really important. We don't have enough people in communication and marketing. Historically, we've not been good enough uh, in enabling these people. Uh, the tools we use are tools for geeks and everything. Uh, we we have uh, we have docu we 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 just set, set up a documentation team. I'm very excited about this. Uh, we have the coders team. We have a, 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 a community engagement team, uh, and it's really interesting because we started uh, by being jack of all trades, and as we're specializing, it's good because we can, you know, embark people who, are, who you know, have differentiating skills, uh, and that just makes a better team. And this team is uh, distributed. Or are you in the same space? No, it's, it's mostly it's online, right? So it, it, COVID yeah. didn't bother you at all because it was already. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's mostly online. You know, we have a lot of people in France. We have something like ten people in France, but we have people worldwide. So I'm not at all familiar with the the latest dynamics, but I remember, maybe it's not, it wasn't even Scikit-Learn, but like open source. The tool we use is Git. GitHub, there are issues that are has to be solved. There are what we call pull requests when somebody wants to contribute. So there is a lot of sort of like it's like a messaging system, right? You have something like a problem and then people start talking about it. And my feeling was that there was a lot of emotions flying around, which were really hard to manage because it was all written. And so as a team manager, when something like this happens in my team, it's much easier for me to resolve it by talking to the person. It's almost like a therapy session and much harder if it's only the written communication. So is there so two questions? Actually, one is what kind of uh, people does it attract to work in this way? And how do you manage this sort of um, soft people management problems in terms of the kind of people i think you know there's one one thing really important in terms of the people who are, who are successful in stick is that you need to have a strong will to serve a community a community of users because uh it, 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 it's hard work you know people it's not that people are unhappy it's that you only hear about the unhappy people it's normal. It's it, it, it's it's like it's a service mentality. You know, it's like uh, being a, a, a first line uh, IT support. When you first line IT support, people only come to you with problems. It's really hard from a mental perspective. Uh, uh, and so you you need you need to be able to cope with this, which means that you need to see your value in the success of others. It's really important. It's basically, I'm going to work really hard to do this thing that is going to appear so minor for the user that's going to improve a bit the convergence of this algorithm or improve this error message. And, and because we have millions of users, because we do have millions of users, it's going to make an impact. It's going to make a difference. But I'm probably not going to see it. That's like the, the hardest thing. And the people who don't have this mentality can't stick around. The people who do, by the way, tend to be very nice people. You know, they might be they might be uh, uh, geeks with no social skills, but behind this, they have a good nature. And so, you know, that's the kind of people who stick around. And then, you know, how do we how do we how do we get this group dynamics? Well, first, we sometimes talk to each other. So something that we really like is to to all get in the same uh, room and work together. We call this sprints. It's amazing. 
I've become worried about carbon footprints. So I, 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 we do less sprints than we used to do, but we have a monthly meeting and we talk to each other in whenever we can, we can, we try to see each other. Whenever I go by a, a city and I know there's someone, I try to see that person. It's also very pleasant. You know, we, there's so much, uh, yeah, coat, sweat, and tears uh, uh, that goes in this library that you just, just seeing someone with whom you, you fought a battle against, uh, against lines of code uh, is, is just very pleasant. And this, by the way, has always been the case. I mean, I remember uh, the, the, during my PhD, flying to the US for a conference, a uh, physics conference, and getting to meet uh, as someone I knew through through internet, uh, 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 working on code, and that person by now got very famous. It's uh, Fernando Perez of the the Jupiter. Uh, uh, just you know, you just you're meeting you're meeting someone you've never met, but is a, is an amazing friend. So there's a lot of this, you know. There's a lot of human aspect, and then you know, back to written culture. You can do things by writing. Uh, I actually like some of the writing you know it's choose your world your words carefully try to be positive and you can do a lot and so you can impact many people and the other thing is that by doing this you're setting standards and then people reproduce those standards and something we're careful about in second learning so there is a sort of like a communication code i we we have a code of conduct it's uh but deeper than so, it, like psychology. Yeah, so. so there's two aspects to 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 any kind of dynamics. There's what's written and what's a socially enforced norm. And there's there's a trade-off, right? You know, not writing anything leads you in what people uh, uh, call the tyranny of the structuralist if you're not careful. Uh, but writing things won't make them happen. Yes. I For things to happen, you need to adapt the social norms. And so this is very much driven by example, driven by who's there. Uh, and I think that's very important. Hmm. Baba, so the physicist friend of us, talked about the one issue in the collaboration that reminds me to this discussion, which is that there are physics tasks and there are what they call technical tasks. Like they need to have people who are experts of the yeah. cooling system because it's, it has to be maintained. They need to have people who can code FPGA or GPU and they need them usually urgently because something goes wrong. On the other hand, the output of the collaboration is the 60 or 80 papers per year with the physics results. And what you said about the person who has very little visibility on his impact on some pipelines, that's what Baba said. Like, it's really hard to measure the impact of somebody who just who really likes to code FPGA. And maybe in a company, he would have like a, an aura or, or some impact that he could see uh, directly. In the, his experiment, it's, it's really, really hard. And so that and that was one problem. The other problem was the, the the hiring. So he said that it's really hard to get these people permanent jobs because most of the permanent jobs in his experiments come from universities who want PhD physicists, not necessarily FPGA engineers. And because of this, it's actually a, a sort of miracle that the those big experiments actually work because they have to do it during a PhD. They have to train people who leave, etc. So, is it there is is there any similarity here? There is, uh, and that's my job basically. What you're describing <laughs> is my job. Is uh, make worrying about people's career that's crucial. Uh, and, and of course, I can't do any miracles, right? Uh, but worrying about people's careers is, is very important. And so, you know, the job of a manager is usually to, to keep the good people happy. Um, and also, so one, one thing that works really well is sending people to conferences, to, to non-scientific conferences, to coding conferences or data science conferences, because they get, they get the, the, the feedback. But some people actually don't want this. Some people 
are happy without this. So, you know, it's a different answer for different people. Uh, and then for with regard to the hiring, that's bloody hard. That's why we need the red hat. <laughs> So Red Hat is a sort of uh, organization where you would get the flow of money and you yeah. could get like, job stability to these people. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so we did a big, big circle. Uh, I have a couple of like more personal questions. I had a really hard time when I still, but uh, especially when I was doing hardcore academic research to bring it home. I almost felt like I had two lives, you know, one a scientist in the lab doing the science and one at home doing the normal human stuff. So do you feel similarly or not at all? And uh, what, what happened? I know your, your partner is also a scientist. So in that sense, you're at home, but what do you tell to your mom what you do and how much it's my mother was a, a a math teacher. Okay. No, I I no, I have no problems. No, not at all. I I I one thing I really enjoy is is talking to people who don't do what I do. I, I find it fascinating. The other day I was uh, uh, taking a cab to come back from a conference, uh, uh, and uh, so the, the the cab driver asked, "So so you're a bunch of computer people, right? That this building is computer people." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." Oh, and in, in what do you do? Do you do AI? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and, and like anything in AI? Well, uh, I'm interested in, in health and AI. And then we basically start, you know, talking, you know, impact of AI in society and AI ethics and everything. And I love talking to people in terms that they understand because I, I, this is what gives a meaning to what I do. Where, where I have more of a problem is when I find scientists who don't value this. And who are like, they're happy in their ivory tower. I, I, I love the continuity. And, and, I, and, and, you know, it's part of what I do also. I want what I do to be meaningful. And if I can't bring it back to something, if I can't discuss this with many people, even if it's simplifying it to the bone, but if I can't explain why I'm doing something, I'm not interested in it. And I think, by the way, it's something important for many, many scientists. I think many, many scientists should worry about this a bit more because this is how you write a great introduction. And because, you know, we tend to write the papers for the people who do exactly the same thing that we do, basically for our reviewers. And even for our reviewers, you know, people always complain that they didn't get a qualified enough reviewer. But the paper should be written for the whole community. And our community is huge. And ideally, it, you know, the, the research, not the paper, but the research should matter to more than our community. That's, that's something I'm passionate about, and that's why I love my job. It's because it allows me to think about many, many things and try to bring it home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we are lucky. AI, AI has become an icebreaker in taxi. <laughs> <laughs> AI is a nice breaker. <laughs> it, it wasn't like that 10 years ago. But everybody knows GPT, so in that sense, uh, we can be thankful for open AI. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Gal. Uh, the last thing I usually ask my guest is to ask me a question. Like, what would you like to know? What excites you? Ah, what excites me? Well, this podcast. Hey, nice. And the Why? blog. Why? <laughs> that was yeah. That's what Baba asked also. <laughs> uh, it's it's very much connected to what you just said about the taxi driver. I want to bring uh, science closer to people, and but it has a very very deep psychological reason that I recently figured out. It's basically I want to be seen, <laughs> right? And everything you described, I completely empathize. Uh, the psychic learn coder who has you, who actually you validate him, and actually the, the the value that maybe is far away comes through you. I often felt in the scientific community that that person was missing. Like we had this, uh, even the you know the the. the 
process of submitting a paper, getting anonymous reviewers, it takes the human out of the picture. You get, of course, very happy when it's accepted, but even then you had like a really good reviewers who you cannot thank, right? So, so that sort of, um, that was one reason why, why I, I, I went into industry because I wanted to be closer to the people or to the customer or inside the company who, who would benefit from what I do. And I wanted to know them personally more than just through, uh, anonymous reviews. Uh, so then, you know, one thing led to the other, and then I figured that uh, it's, a, it's the right time to do a podcast where we talk about AI and we talk about talk with the people behind AI. I also want to do much broader than just uh, AI and even broader than scientists, and because I'm very much interested in psychology and even like organizational sociology. I mean, you, you saw it in my question. There's still science, by the way. Some, yeah, some of it is science, but I, I would say that like the value question, the why question is pro, is profoundly non-scientific. It's, and it's not a criticism of it. It's just, um, it's an orthodox. Philosophy then. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So philosophy sort of connects it, but also, you know, theology, psychology, sociology, so all these things. And of course, all those things have scientific uh, aspects. You can study sociology or psychology from with a scientific uh, class, but it's there's much more more than that because of um, you know the internal view, which is first person and and hard to study from the third person scientific view. So I'm very much in this you know this um, cloud where I want to. It's 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 partly for me to figure it out. You know, it's I found it not very easy to just write in my you know ivory tower just listen to youtube videos and write so i wanted to do something that's uh, more dialogical because actually the, the best thing is when we discover something together you had a couple of moments when you said that uh, you're just making it up which is it's really actually a good thing you know that's why we talk so these, these these are the things that excite me and also the, there is the blog where but they, i use the blog also to clear my mind actually you know because it's uh, by writing things uh, things uh, auto clarify themselves Always. Yeah, exactly Always. and and it's also it's almost like a dialogue with myself i write something and then then it generates something you know the mysteries of his thoughts so this this is what what excites me and of course uh, i'm also very much excited with my by my research at to a way which I'm trying to connect to all these things. So it's basically about uh, agency, reinforcement learning, uh, planning, thinking machines, and then putting them into hardware that we interact with. So that's basically like you know the big picture of uh, of the research we do. And so yeah, I'm. Uh, I mean, at, I'm at a point in my life where I'm pretty happy and <laughs> have a lot of things to get excited about. Yeah. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Excited about things is a good way of uh, staying happy. <laughs> yeah, and then there's also a lot of things I do uh, with my body that I really enjoy. And that's that's recent. When I realized that, you know, psychological issues are easier to heal through the body. Yeah. And, it's uptown uh, to work. It's a 12, uh, 12 kilometers uh, bike ride. And it's really important uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So physical and also movement and also relational movement like dance and stuff and jujitsu, which, you know, <laughs> thanks Facebook. <laughs> nice. That's like how how life is. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much, Gal. It was a great, great pleasure talking to you, and I I enjoyed it from the beginning. I was a bit nervous in the beginning. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> <It> still happens, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Vanish. It was a real pleasure for me too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, and I uh, hope you hope to see you in real life soon. We should. We should. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you.